All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. So um, one of the cool beans, uh, William Goff, was a little concerned about the way Delta variant is moving, the way pandemic is progressing, and if there is a light at the end of the tunnel or not. And the second was a single dose vaccine versus multiple doses. So I thought that we should talk about that because I am curious about these things as well. So I did some research today, and that is what we'll discuss. Number one. Number two, I hope you enjoyed the talk with Dr. Tariq Alam this morning. Once again, shout out to Dr. Samina Chaudhary for connecting us with Dr. Tariq Alam. And number three, tomorrow we'll have Dr. Eric Osgood with us from FLCCC. In addition to that, I just saw that Denise said that she has uh, symptoms. I hope it is not COVID, but you have started the management and I hope and pray, we all hope and pray that you recover soon. Please do tell me if you needed anything. Um, I, I am here. I had a chat with Margaret as well today too. Her phone is still not there. And so uh, till that time, um, she is absent. So with this, let's start our discussion. All the links are present in the description. This is drbean.com. This is Dr. Bean on Odyssey. So I would uh, request you to start watching more over here because my hope is to transition from YouTube to Odyssey in the, uh, in the coming days. This is a very good uh, article where they talk about the evidence for Delta variant to be lower fatality or higher fatality and so on. So their basic gist over here is that um, because Delta variant or because the pandemic is at a stage where more youngsters are becoming ill with COVID, hence the fatality rate is generally low in the younger population, attributing that to Delta may not be correct. And I agree with them. At the same time, I would also say that Delta is actually not causing too much of a damage. So please keep that in mind. And for this, there is a Wall Street Journal uh, article here. This is the article. It is behind a paywall. But if you open it on a mobile phone, you can you can read it. And so I wanted to read a, a specific part of this that is interesting for US hospitalization. So these are two doctors who have done this data analysis and published in Wa Wall Street Journal. And they are talking about Delta. So this is the first part of our discussion to say, how is Delta doing? Then we look at the progress in various countries, and then we look at the vaccine. So these are the three things. So they say here, US hospitalization data also show not only that higher Delta prevalence doesn't go hand in hand with higher hospitalizations. So more Delta virus doesn't mean more hospitalizations. Again, keeping in mind that, yes, nowadays, the one who are becoming ill are mostly youngsters, and they do not end up in hospitals normally. These numbers appear inversely correlated. So actually, the correlation is the other way around. What is the correlation? Places that had higher percentage of Delta variant had lower ratios of hospitalized people to COVID cases. So again, this data and the article is present here. I'm just reading it from here. Whatever else we know or don't know about Delta, its prevalence clearly isn't driving hospitalizations. When we look at current hospitalization data across the country, the most striking predictive pattern is that a high vaccination rate in a region accurately predicts a lower hospitalization rate. So there are two messages in here. One message is that wherever people are vaccinated, hospitalizations have reduced. And secondly, wherever there is Delta, it's not necessary that hospitalizations have increased. So that is an important thing to keep in mind as well. And now I'm going to start going into details for the um, countries, starting from US. So here, uh, again, the, the question in our mind is that are we going to get out of this pandemic anytime soon? Where, where do we sta stand? Are we going to get one more wave with Delta? So I gave you one data point from these authors about Delta. 
I also wanted to see this as well. So this is the number of cases now that are at 26,720. They have gone back up from 12, so almost doubled the number of cases. However, if you see here, and it's a good thing that the number of deaths have not followed that yet. There is a decoupling, unlinking of the deaths to the uh, cases. And there can be many factors. For example, one factor, Delta could be becoming weaker. The corona, human corona, this uh, SARS-CoV-2 may be becoming more and more human coronavirus. That is one possible factor. The second possible factor is more and more youngsters are becoming infected. And because of that, they would resist and handle it better. And the third possibility is more and more people are becoming either vaccinated or had infection and have recovered. So there is herd immunity. There is a reduction in the opportunity. And then there is another factor, and that is those who were older or who were more vulnerable, unfortunately, may have already gotten exposed and caught it. So because of that, there is a de decoupling or unlinking of the death related to the cases, and it is a good thing. So now I want to show you one more thing about US, which is really important to look at. And that is the following. And this number that I'm going to share with you about US, the, the basic calculation that I've done here is to understand how much of the US has become either infected and recovered or vaccinated, or how much of the US is healthy youngsters which make the basic group now that is less, less prone to the Delta damage or SARS-CoV-2 damage. So US population 330 million-ish, about that. Infected folks here are about 35 million, and here is the data. About 35 million are infected and recovered. I will consider them as part of the herd immunity. I know that there is so much of a discussion to say they should all get vaccinated and so on. For me, they are um, vaccinated, they, they are protected, and we are good there. And there are some um, studies as well in the articles that I just showed you. In the Wall Street Journal article and another article I'll show you shortly, they actually have studies that one vaccine dose even may be enough. And I studied shared that study with the cool beans here as well, that the, the researchers injected one dose of vaccine after a person had been infected by the virus and, and recovered. Then they injected the second dose, and second dose didn't do much difference. One dose added some more boosting, but not a lot. So infected 35 million, fully vaccinated 160 million. This data is coming from CDC. So if I go here to CDC, this is their page. Again, the link is in the description. If you see here, 160.4 million people fully vaccinated. So here on this right column is the fully vaccinated people's number. So although they say that 48.3% of the population is fully vaccinated, what they are not counting is people who have already become infected. That should be counted, that number should be counted in protected people. So that makes a total of 195. And one can say that it is possible that they are not, we should not add them like this because there are going to be some of these 35 million that have become vaccinated as well and are counted here in 160 as well. So that is a double count. So I would say that 195 million is the upper range and 160 million, if we count them all who are infected, they also became part of the vaccinated group too. So then maybe the lower range is 160. I'm sure that the number is between 160 and 195. In this 160 million people who are um, vaccinated, there are 8 million children that is between the age of 12 to 18, they are also vaccinated. So there is a small a group of children here as well. So that means if we go in here, remember yesterday we talked about it that there are 80 million people. So we talked about UK. So sorry, 80 million people 
are between the age of 12 to 18 children. 8 million of them are already vaccinated. That leaves 72 million. We saw yesterday that the children are 12 to 18 years of age have, or even uh, 0 to 18 years of age, have a very low rate of uh, mortality. We saw that yesterday. So the 72 million number here, I don't think that we need to be running around to say they must become vaccinated right away. So I actually count them in relatively protected group. They are better handlers of COVID compared to older folks or people with comorbidities. So 195 plus 72 is 267 million. That is once again the upper range. I'm sure it is not that it is lesser than it. And on the lower side, 160 million and 72, that is 232 million. That is the lower range. So the number is going to be somewhere in the middle. That is the number of people who are protected, in my opinion. That means out of 330 million people, 200, if we took the upper range, 267 million people are protected. That leaves 63 million adults between the age of 18 to 65 as unvaccinated and possibly at risk. Again, their risk is also less, not as less as children and not as high as 65 plus, but there is risk there. This is a 65 million. So think about it for a second that a country that where we started with 330 million people exposed to the virus versus 63 million people possibly left, or if we took the lower range, then 98 million. So somewhere between them is the number that is left actually to be vaccinated or to be infected and recovered, or maybe they'll just be protected. In this group, what is missing? I think some of you would have been thinking about it. So what is missing is the asymptomatic group. Because I do not have the right data for that, that what is the exact correct percentage of the asymptomatic? That's why I cannot really write it here to say we have half of them are asymptomatically recovered. I don't know. So putting that data in here would just dilute the whole message. So I have not talked about asymptomatic. If we add that, we would actually see even further improvement. So what does this mean? At most, 19% of the population is left or 30% of the population is left. Do you know both of those numbers fall in the original attempt of herd immunity to be 70, 74%? 74% was the original number. Remember, we used to do R0 equals R0 minus 1 divided by R0. And R0 used to be 2.5 or so. And that would give us 74%, 70%-ish. So we are actually in that ballpark. This, again, not considering the asymptomatic yet. So even if it is minimum, 30% is left. What does that mean? Possibly 81% are protected. I think if you add asymptomatic, this number would improve. Or at minimum, 70% are protected. Once again, where is the difference when CDC comes out and says 48.3% are vaccinated? So they're talking about vaccination. Their whole focus is vaccination. Even today, when the, the Surgeon General comes out and says that we got to take on the people who are um, causing vaccine hesitancy. I think soon they're going to start causing. Uh, it, I heard that they're going to use Patriot Act. I do not know how much is, of this is true to start talking to people who may be talking about vaccines. So we'll see here. CDC is saying 48.3% vaccinated. Ideally, we should be saying how many are protected. 
And I know that the authorities are not willing to even look at that. Otherwise, they would have been looking at the positive COVID tests and saying, you guys are good. They're not doing it. So they're going to keep stuck sticking to this number. In my opinion, number is 70% or better. So then where is the risk? What is happening? The risk is there is 21% of 65 plus that are not yet vaccinated. So if you see here, the CDC's data, population 65 years of age and plus, 79.3% have become vaccinated. That is about 21% still left. And the population was, uh, I did the calculation, so about 11 million people are still left that are 65 million, uh, sorry, 65 plus and are not vaccinated. There is a risk here. That is one area of the risk. Then individuals with comorbidities, regardless of their age, as we saw yesterday from UK data, children who had comorbidities were at a higher risk. Similarly, we know that anyone with a comorbidity is at a higher risk. So out of this remaining 30% of the population, about 198, 90 million people, whoever has comorbidities, they may be at risk. I also want to acknowledge this, that this 98 to 90 million people have gone on for 15, 16 months now, and they did not become ill, which is a good news. So whatever they're doing, they're protecting themselves better, or their family people are around them, they're taking care of them better, or they became asymptomatic and recovered. I don't know. But if they can go on for 15 months, I would, I would hope that they would continue to stay protected with whatever measures they are taking. But people with the comorbidities are at a higher risk. Then folks who are between the age of 18 to 65 are 52 million, the upper range of the numbers that we are calculating, 87 million, the lower range number. So this is the number that is, I should not say upper range. So this is 52 million is the lower, 87 is the upper. So between this number is the number that is left for US. So what is my conclusion for US? My conclusion is very similar to the conclusion I just read to you about the, um, the two doctors. One is, I think that US is coming out of the pandemic. I think for the most part, we have come out of the pandemic. Second is, the group that is left is mostly now youngsters. There are 11 million 65 plus. That is very different from almost one third of the population that was 50, 65 plus. That is two. Third, there is a large group, about 72 million children, 12 to 18 years of age, that have a very decent potential to fight with the virus without much damage. That is three. And then fourth is when you count all the numbers of vaccinated, infected, and recovered children, you have a very large number of population that has become protected. So this is UK, sorry, US for me. So I think that the idea of will we be able to start you know, going out together, meeting each other together. I think we are we are there. Now, are there communities where there is a larger number of unvaccinated folks or uninfected folks or folks who would not like to have masks? There may be. And those communities would have their own dynamics. But I think generally we are out. And I think Delta is not something that we should be too worried about. Maybe this will change in the future and we'll know more. But so far from the data, Delta is not showing any huge issues. I would actually take it at any time. If Delta doesn't cause long hauling, then I would take it at any time to have the infection, but no chances of dying or hospitalizing. Nuisance like a common cold, fine. OK, so continuing. UK. I thought UK is also an interesting one, although nowadays I know that um, Indonesia has become 
a hotspot. We'll look into that as well. So this is U US. Here is Statista. This is the data I used. I want to show you the data as well. How did I calculate? I downloaded this table from, is it? Yes, from Statista. And what I did was I marked these numbers and I used their sums. This is 2019 data. We are in 2021, I realize it. But this is the data. I cannot just get the newer data. So when I cannot get the newer data, I use older data. Many people comment and object that, why did I use older data? I don't have a magic wand to go get the current data. So whatever data I have is the data I can use. So this is the data. Then if we now go to UK. So UK, look at this. The cases, look at the wave, the new wave here. Remember, a few days ago, we were talking about 2,000 cases, and they're becoming 4,000 and 8,000. And now we are at 42,000 cases, July 14, 42,000 new cases. However, and I totally understand it. So before you say that, hey, the deaths cannot correlate one day to a day, it is four to six weeks. What I did was I actually looked at the data from here for the cases from here and saw there um, that, for example, for 2,000 cases, how many folks were dying? I saw this data today. And then we know that in UK from April, there was COVID there. So I took April's data and I looked at the number of deaths. And once again, there is no similar correlation as it used to be with the deaths. And once again, totally acknowledging that, going back to this original article that I showed you here, that it is not that the Delta is causing more fatalities or less fatalities. It is that number one, the people left now are youngsters. People more resistant are vaccinated or more vulnerable are now resistant by vaccination then we know that the number of people who are infected and recovered are also there. I would still add asymptomatic, but there is no good way to count them. So if you take them all, UK has reached a point where once again, there is an uncoupling of the association between the cases and death. And that is a welcome thing. We, uh, I have been hearing from people for a long time and I have been saying, okay, we'll wait. People have been saying that, hey, we got to wait four to six weeks for the deaths that would be related to this. But we know that since February, March timeframe, UK started seeing Delta variant. And even then there is no relationship to the deaths as it used to be in the older uh, earlier peaks. So anyone who looks at this number of cases and does not look at hospitalizations and deaths in UK is actually not looking at the correct way of uh, the data as it is. So that is UK. I like this. Here, COVID vaccine. So in the UK, 46 million people in the UK have become vaccinated with at least one dose. And we know that one dose UK's experiment has worked very well for them. So I wanna, today's discussion, I do wanna address one dose as well. So I'll go to that a little later. So UK population 67.9 million in 2020, vaccinated 46 million, infected 5 million, total protected 51 million, then children, and young, we, we saw that number yesterday, I believe, that was 12 million. We saw that out of them, about half a million had already infected and recovered. Anyways, I took the whole 12 million. So this is 63 million of the population, which is in protected range in UK. And that is out of 67.9, 63 million. It's a good population. So because of that, we see this uncoupling of case to death ratio, and that is a good thing. 
And here, if you are interested, which population, what kind of vaccine, how many vaccines, and so on. This is a good article here. Then I want to go to Israel. And this is where I have, I object on even some of my friends who I see when they are tweeting and they talk about Israel with percentages to say Delta is wreaking havoc in Israel by adding so much percentage of new cases and deaths. Look at Israel. Here are the new cases. That is correct that they had been saying almost no cases. From there, they went back to now 797 cases. So that's a large number change compared to where they were before. That is zero. But if you look at the bigger waves, they are still low. And this may be the beginning. We might see some more. But once again, there is an uncoupling. We will see this latest wave in the UK, uh, in Israel here, this wave. We have to wait. This is started somewhere in July, June 24th. And now we are at July 24th. So June 24th, at least 28 days. So July 22, 21 is till that time. We'll see what deaths. So, so far in this time frame, there are a few deaths. And we'll see how many more. And that is the number that may be there. But once again, there is a huge dissociation. All factors the same way. People who are vaccinated, people who are left are younger. Uh, vi virus may be becoming less, less strong and so on. So again, if we start talking about percentages, it starts looking bad. But look at the numbers. So whenever we have to look at this data, any data, we should look at both uh, things. We should look at absolute numbers. We should look at the percentages and we should look at the trends. Interestingly, these waves are not 100% comparable to each other because the first wave infected more those who were vulnerable and so on. So now these waves are occurring in those who are less vulnerable. So this is Israel. There is another very decent um, data collection here about Israel. And once again, number of infections, number of cases, as we just saw. Down here, they have, this is what was interesting. This is overall comparison of Israel with the world. So for example, infections globally, if I hover my mouse here, it would say, this is US, 34.1 million. US is the leader. Again, populations is different as well. US is 330 million. Uh, Israel is 9.3 million. So those absolute numbers do not compare when we look at absolute populations. Here, the percentages will become important. This is why absolute numbers, percentages, and trends, all three will have to be looked at. But you, US is leading. And if you see here, uh, Israel is at a lower number. So this is also an interesting uh, um, link to review. So I want to quickly look at the Israel's numbers here. Israel, 9.3 million. Oh, sorry, I heard Luffy. 9.3 million population, 5.3 million vaccinated, fully vaccinated, or 58%. This is from Bloomberg. So Bloomberg numbers are, are a little off from the actual numbers from Israel. Infected and recovered, this is world meter 0 0.8 million. Total 6.1 million. And then if you take the youngsters and so on, I think Israel is doing very well as well. The point of all of this is to say, these are the countries that I continue to look at on Twitter, that people just making up whatever. They would pick up a way of looking at the number that would create the most concern. If a percentage looks bad, they're going to show you the percentage. If an absolute number looks bad, then they're going to show you the absolute number. But if you look at it, we are actually not doing badly for some of the countries. There are countries that are still not doing good. For example, if we continue with our discussion here,
So this is about the vaccines. But let me just quickly show you. Indonesia, look at this. This is their second and a half wave. And look at the deaths, number of deaths that are following. So Indonesia is actually in a similar situation as India was. Again, the populations are different, so the absolute numbers are different. But if you look at the trends or the percentages, Indonesia is not doing well. India, if you see on the other hand, has started improving a lot. Look at this. And this is where I protest a little to my those friends who are actually looking at India and saying, this is ivermectin. And then they go to Israel and try to say, vaccine has failed. That is wrong. If you look at Israel's data as well, it does not show that the vaccine has failed. Similarly, if you look at India's data, it does not show that ivermectin doesn't work. So I do not know why the camps have to be formed to say, if you talk about ivermectin, then you have to say vaccines are bad. Or if you say vaccines are good, then you have to say ivermectin is bad. I think there is a, there is a benefit of both. And we also saw the disadvantages yesterday with the UK study for vaccines. Now, this is Brazil. If you look at Brazil, Brazil somehow, it just continues to go steadily in this state. They are improving. But if you see here, they improve and they go bad, although this time their improvement is much better. My suspicion will be, I did not study the data a lot. My suspicion would be, once again, those who were vulnerable became infected and now there is more younger population and lesser population left for the virus okay so back here now i want to talk about the vaccines and i have this link over here this is actually a very important um, article to read is one vaccine dose enough and they have a caveat here, if you have had COVID. So I actually shared this study with the cool beans over here. We talked about it, people who had recovered and when we were vaccinating them, one dose versus two doses, what happened, uh, you may remember. This is basically that study. But again, at the end of it, their message is, look, France, Germany, and Italy, among other countries, now advise only one dose of the vaccine for people with a healthy immune system and a confirmed previous diagnosis. Very wise. I would actually have said even that one dose is not necessary. Similarly, if you go down here, a team of researchers at the Rockefeller University in New York City and elsewhere studied 26 people who had contracted the virus early in the course of pandemic. All of them subsequently received at least one dose of either the Pfizer-BioNTech or the Moderna. And if you see here, just one dose of vaccine generated titers equal to or higher than than those produced by two doses of vaccine in people without infection. And I, I actually uh, had shared this study. Providing only one dose to dose to those who would have COVID-19 would free up many urgently needed vaccine doses. So this is with COVID-19. Now, if we look at the article which shows without COVID-19, there is a, an article here. Actually, it's it was behind a paywall, so I had to go here. Uh, how much protection do you get from one shot of the Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Moderna? This is a very, very important point. And many, many folks have been asking, including uh, the cool bean, William. So here, uh, I have gone over this and I'll just show you the summary and I could not highlight it here. I don't have the highlighter on Firefox. So let me just show you what I collected from this. Here is the data. Pfizer BioNTech with one dose, they had revealed the efficacy of 52.4%. Range was 29% to 84%. Although the researchers, so this is all the data coming from this article. I'm not making it up. So the researchers in that article say that we think that the efficacy is about 80%. And I would uh, request you to observe UK. We have actually discussed the study from the UK where they said after one dose, about 84 days into the one dose, 
meaning without the second dose, the efficacy was above 80%. So yes, when the second dose was given, the efficacy went above 90%, but above 80% is a pretty good efficacy as well. And the more important part was there was a lot of protection from hospitalization and death. So UK study, and I had actually shared that study here. So UK study had shown there is a benefit of just one dose. And if you keep giving time, that dose improves. Admittedly, that study was about adenovirus-based vaccines, not about the Moderna or, or uh, Pfizer. So how, now we're talking about Moderna and Pfizer from this article, 80% with one dose. And again, it's a function of time. If you take one dose today, tomorrow, you do not have 80% protection. It has to be many months before 80% protection is reached. And we know that this number of 29 to 84% is a lower number because it was within the first two, three weeks. So if you are within first two, three weeks of the first dose, imagine that you are still as vulnerable as you didn't have the vaccine. But as the time passes, the, the immunity would continue to build. So this article says about 80% will build. Then Moderna reported efficacy from data 69.5% after one dose range 43 to 84% after one dose but again this is one dose before the second dose so it is really the data looked at soon after the dose within a month not beyond the month and so researchers say that we believe that beyond a month as more time passes the efficacy will be about 80% as well. And I'll show you those once again, so you don't feel that Mubin is just making up these numbers. AstraZeneca, this is what I am, uh, so this article says 70%. I remember from the study that I shared, it said 84% after three months. So this is the only piece of data here, which is Mubin's recall, and I may be wrong. Now, let me just go show you the rest of the data. Here, Pfizer and Moderna's vaccines are likely 80% effective against symptomatic COVID-19 after one dose. The missing part of this message, after how many weeks? My suspicion is that this is going to be two to three months after. A single AstraZeneca shot is probably at least 70% effective at preventing symptoms from COVID-19. So this is the data, and you can then look at this data by yourself as well. So see here, Pfizer shot was 52.4% effective at protecting against COVID-19 with symptoms between the first and second dose. So that is within the two, three weeks time. But the 52.4% figure includes the 11 days before protection kicks in after the first dose. So the real percentage is going to be higher. What are they talking about? They're saying... Let's say there is the, and I know you know it, it's just <laughs> being on the same page. So let's say the dose one is given here. Dose one is given here. It is still going to take 11 days or so, or five to seven days for the whole immune system to actually start responding. So before this, there is no, no antibody, there is no preparation. This is as bad a time as not vaccinated. Then what would happen is, let's say the second dose is here. So really, the efficacy between this and this point is going to be higher. But if you add the lower efficacy during this time and take the average of both of them, then the efficacy looks lower. This is what they're talking about, that, hey, because the 11 days in the efficacy calculation are those where the antibodies are yet not strong enough or not even formed yet, because of that, this actual number is going to be higher, which I agree with. So what is the number that they think? Uh, they think somewhere over here, probably 80% or even 90%. If you look at Moderna, Moderna's reported number, again, with the same message of the windowing, 69.5%. Reported range was 43 to 84%. However, they feel this included that 13 days before the protection started. And because of that, the percentage is actually going to be better. So that is for the Moderna 
So see here, 80% protection or even better than 90%. And finally, it is AstraZeneca, more than 70%. We actually know better for AstraZeneca from UK study, which showed 80 to 84%. So this is the discussion for today. A little more focused towards um, some of the pandemic's progress and the vaccines. So let's do this. Let's have a couple of questions. Then let's have a few minutes of chit chat or maybe miss it. I want to go out with my brother and we have already done two talks today. So if you are OK, I can skip it. Let's just see any big burning question here. Um, Eileen says, thanks, doctor, for your data comparison. Death ratio don't seem to compare with variant. Then why is Israel starting to push the third shot? It is reported they are starting with seniors. Also, I PM you an, an audio regarding Esther Black in Israel, who has done MR research working with post-vax. So how are the administrators responding is really, I do not know why. To me, it seems like sometimes the fear mongering becomes so bad that people start becoming panicky and they start doing um, reactive decisions. That is one possibility. Another possibility is the pressure from the vaccine companies as well. You just saw a few days ago that one of the vaccine companies started saying, we need to give a booster for Delta. And U.S. authorities had to come out and say no. And I think if the U.S. authorities were not too concerned that saying that a booster is needed would make people even more upset about vaccines, I think they would have said, yeah, go ahead, do it. So exactly why did they decide it, I do not know. But at least from the data. For Israel, we are just seeing an uptick now. We actually have to wait for a few weeks to see if there is a relationship to death. But from UK, you can see there is no relationship of Delta to death for the factors that I just spoke of. And then in the US, you can also see that the things are not that bad. India, where Delta originated or was discovered or was found, they have a huge drop. So again, the reasons can all be different, but collectively we are seeing that these numbers are going down. Genesis Light says her doctor said no second. So hopefully no second dose of the vaccine, which is good. Jody says, is it possible it's just the time passing that increases effect effectiveness and the second dose is taking the credit and actually superfluous? Actually, Jody, I, this is such a beautiful uh, question. I shared a study which showed that second dose, if you do it like UK and that is three months apart, it takes from 84 to 94. So it adds 10 more percent efficacy. Maybe if they don't give the second dose at, on third month, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth months, the efficacy will reach actually 90, 94% too. Comparing that, the study that I shared, and that is recorded, so it is one of these videos. Comparing that, giving the second dose earlier reduced the overall efficacy because the second dose quashed the system's preparation. So I still remember in my head when I was preparing it that, oh, man, it means that we should not give a second dose so early. I still have that sentence stuck in my head from that study. So yes, you're correct. It seems like second dose is given too early. And maybe in some cases it's not even needed. Maybe if we waited three, four months, we would see that the first dose has enough of efficacy that we don't need to go for the second dose. Okay, so <clears throat> so Harris says, I love Dr. Bean. However, anyone pushing the jab at this point must stop. There is zero need by the data. So I do not know that what was the uh, your connection here. If you're thinking I am pushing the vaccines, 
I have always been very, very clear. And uh, I feel I cannot change people's opinions. What I see is that those who do not want to have a vaccine, and they would react to anyone who is talking about vaccine. And they find it necessary to tear him down or to attack him. Uh, I have never done it. And I now I have reached a point to say, I don't care. I talk about vaccines, positive things. I talk about their negative aspects. I talk about ivermectin as well. I talk about the things that I feel are useful for the public to know. Now, how do you digest that and use that is your headache. Sorry, I've become just so um, clear about this. Guy Telfer says, is penicillin used in treatment of COVID-19 severe and critical conditions considering adjuvants or vaccinated with damage? Um, I do not understand, Guy, the role of penicillin in this, uh, this uh, structure. Okay, so Michelle, Michelle, hello, after a long time. Uh, T cell test first, then one dose of Moderna for 991.11 year old. I totally agree with this. Any proof of a previous infection should allow the person to have an option of vaccine, not a mandate of vaccine. And that person should have similar privileges and unfortunately there are privileges now with the vaccine that who can enter here and who can travel there and who can do what the person who can prove that they were uh, they have recovered should be treated as as best as a vaccinated person so i think that that even one dose is necessary not necessary but sure one dose <laughs> John Ria says, can we ask your older brother for some funny family stories about you? <laughs> we'll play nice. So I do not know where he is. I'm going to see if he's here nearby. So looks like he may not be here. He was sitting in the living room when I started. So he may have stepped out. So I will bring him in. He's going to be here for two weeks. And we are we are quite close, so <laughs> I will have him here. Maybe if, tomorrow we have Dr. Osgood with us, so maybe Monday. M. Gregory says, let's take this as the last question. M. Gregory says, is it right to blame mutations on non-vaccinated people? It is incorrect to blame either group vaccinated or unvaccinated and i was talking with someone a friend of mine and i was saying this is such a bad situation humans we as humans are behaving so badly that we have made groups vaccinated and and i honestly uh, or i received messages where people are really honest in asking this question that someone in my family is vaccinated can i be with them or someone in my family is not vaccinated, are they going to make me sick? And that is because of this muddied uh, rumors that many of the so-called experts have created. So the simple answer, M. Gregory, uh, no. A person who is not vaccinated cannot be blamed for mutation. A person who is vaccinated cannot be blamed for mutation. A mutation will occur in everyone, give me one second. I think Luffy's in the other room and wants to do it. I don't know where he is. A mutation would occur whenever a virus is in a person, regardless of their vaccinated or unvaccinated status. OK, cool. So uh, tell me this. Should we do a chit chat or? Can we take today's <laughs> Luffy is somewhere over here. So should we skip the chit chat today and uh, maybe then talk tomorrow?
So I'm just looking at the responses. So let's do this. Let's talk tomorrow. Thank you very much. So no chit chat for today. Thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow with Dr. Eric Osgood. Have a good day and love you all. Stay safe and protected. And I'll see you tomorrow. Please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share. <laughs> and so there was a question about my brother. So he, yeah, he's a fun brother. Um, so um, please like, subscribe, and share. And if you would like to support this work, um, which is totally a not fear mongering work, <laughs> then there are three links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, or you can use PayPal to support this work, or you can be a patron. Thank you, and I would see you tomorrow.